They say you should never meet your heroes. It'll either be awkward or they'll just let you down. But I say, bugger that. Hi, I'm Matt Stewart, and in this series, I'm going to be meeting some of my childhood idols, including musicians, comedians, and sports people. For this episode, I spoke to my all-time favourite AFL player, St Kilda football club legend, Justin Frankie Peckett. Frankie Pegger, thanks so much for joining me. Um, I don't want to make this awkward early, but you are uh, my hero. That is awkward. <laughs> thanks so much for doing this. This is wild. I can't believe I'm in the same room as you. <laughs> You're scraping the bottom of the barrel if I'm one of your heroes, surely. No, no, no. No, not at all. You're right up the top. Well, this is one of the funny things to me. I don't know if you necessarily get... Just as a footballer, you don't probably... Uh, get the Careful. respect you deserve, I don't think. Yep. But, I mean, you, you'd be aware of that. You played in a team with so many all-time greats of, of the Saints. Robert Harvey, Plugger, Danny Frawley. I mean, you know, you'd be familiar with them. But um, I think sometimes you get lost in the mix there. You were second in the BNF in our uh, grand final year, 97. Third. Third. You need to do your research. Second in 94. Both times pipped by Robert Harvey. Hard to win them when Haas was playing. Yeah, I know, that is tricky. Yep. All-time games record holder, et cetera. Yep. And, yeah, but I, I, somehow I think people forget that. You did that from a back flank, back pocket. Yeah. Wing, working up to the wing. Yeah, and then towards the bench, sort of full circle. <laughs> well, how do you win? How do you go top three in the BNF from the bench? You can't, unless you're doing a lot of good work from behind the scenes. Um, I think the coaches liked me. Most of them. Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it, there's a few parallels I've been learning about you and me. We arrived at Moorabbin the same year. Yep. You to the, the club, yep. me to the suburb, living there yep. uh, in 1989. How old right? were you in 89? 89, I was five. Okay. Yeah. That's depressing. Oh, oh I was 16. So. Yeah, well, you know, yep. I have, I'm not an AFL legend. So, you know, we've both got depression, <laughs> I suppose, going on there. Um, and yeah, you... You, I don't know if I knew this, but you were a Saints fan growing up as well. I was. I was born into it. So um, my grandparents, all my family were St Kilda supporters um, based in Cheltenham. Um, and so uh, it was just what you did. Followed suit, went yeah. to Moorabbin each week. Um, and I got either the, it was either a curse or a good thing to barrack for St Kilda. When I got drafted, you lived in a, in, well, I lived in Frankston. It was either this side of the fence, you go to Hawthorne, this side of the fence, you go to St Kilda. So I lived on the St Kilda side. Again, you know, that's either a good thing or you go to Hawthorne and potentially you're playing a few flags. Um, but yeah, born into a St Kilda barracking family and I'm, I'm wrapped that I was and I've passed that, that joy on to my kids, um, which is not negotiable in our household. Yeah, I think that's a good rule. It's, yeah. hard, it's a hard one because it's, yeah, it's, I, you know, I, I agree, I think you've done the right thing, but you are sort of passing on some sadness as well. <laughs> That's a heavy burden. It is a burden. Yeah. But, I mean, can you imagine how good it's going to be when yeah. we have a premiership? Character building builds resilience, and I think it'll be the greatest premiership in the history of the AFL, the, the St Kilda's next one, whenever that yeah. happens. I think my friends and family know um, not to expect me. Yep. I, said, I, I don't know where I'm going to end up, yep. but I hope, it's, I hope it takes a yep. plane... Right to get there. Yep. I hope I wake up and go, what's happened? Yep. I yes. mean, I mean, I, I don't want to paper over the premierships you're involved in. Minor <laughs> Premiership 97, <laughs> uh, the Ansett Cup 96 pre-season, of course, the famous mm. one. The, you, you play the Wizard Cup, Granny? No, I, didn't, I don't think I made the cut for that team. Oh, um, so missed the Wizard Cup. I missed that one. Um, but, yeah, those night premierships are something I reflect on regularly um, <laughs> uh, with a lot of pride. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting because apart from those premierships, I played in an under-17 one in, uh, actually that would have been in 89. I came to St Kilda, played a few games, then the season finished, I went back and played at my local club and I got to play in a premiership in the under-17s. Oh, Last premiership of, of any meaning that I've ever played in. So you, you, did, you really didn't feel anything in that <laughs> Ansett Cup? Not really, no. It's funny because it really did mean something to us. <laughs> like it was, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't think, I didn't even really understand how dire the eighties were for the yep. club. Yeah. Because I you know, I, I was living in the country, I didn't I just missed it. Yeah. And I was four, you know. Yep. But um 
yeah, I remember we got locked out. That was, everyone went to Waverley that night. I yep. think all of Moorabbin and yep. surrounds. Um, and yeah, so we, we got home and watched the second half on TV. But I mean, maybe it was because I was 10 years old, but it was one of the best memories. Yeah, oh, and still is for a lot of people, um, unfortunately. But it gives you some insight into how big it would be if the Saints won a proper yeah. premiership. And then in 97, um, won 10 in a row to make the grand final. And a bit of like a bunch of uh, unlucky things happened. Two ruckmen go down. Yep. One of, maybe one of our greatest ruckmen of all time. Yep. Maybe one of our other greatest ruckmen of all time. Yep. Laser, yep. one of my all time faves. Yep. Um, and, you know, that hurts. And then apparently, I mean, I don't know too much about the details, but I think there were there was other bits and pieces going on behind the scenes that... Yep. And despite all that, was still in the game all the way deep into the last quarter. Yeah. Took charm and the, yeah. just, he couldn't miss. I haven't watched it since. Neither. Um, I probably never will watch it. What are your memories of it? Uh, look, it was awesome week leading up. Um, greatest moment of your football life, you know, when you run out in the MCG. Um, I'd never been to an AFL grand final. So this was the first time I'd been to one. the first time I'd been to one as well. Yeah, I've never been to one since either. As I, I don't watch them on TV and I've never been to one. Right. But amazing experience at the start. And then by 5pm, by it's the worst time you've ever had in your life. So... Um, That's how I remember the day as well. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't speak to anyone, including family, for the next four days, apparently. Yep. <laughs> Which is a, yeah, it's a fun, isn't it? A, it's a strange thing. I, you know, it makes sense. You were there. You were a part of it. Yep. I was sitting and watching it. Yep. But it hurts, I wouldn't say as much, but it feels like it, maybe it does. I think it might hurt you more than it's hurt me. Yeah. So, the yeah, it's bittersweet for you, like it is probably for everyone. But you were the third best player, as voted for by the club that year. Yep. You, do you reflect on that at all, ever? Um, do you, I mean, how do you see yourself as a footballer? Do you think of yourself as a great footballer? No, nah, not nowhere near it. Good average player. Um, I had my moments. I had a few games where I played okay, and a couple of seasons where I was reasonably consistent. But overall, I think I underperformed. And um, you know, I should have played 300 games. I, I should have played in the Premiership. Um, you know, uh, when I reflect on my career, there's lots of blokes who played 200 plus games and or played less and played in flags, and that's what I look at. So I, you know, if you you have Dermot Burden up here, you're going to introduce him as a five-time five-night. You can introduce me. This is Justin Peckett, who played in an ANSET Cup <laughs> <laughs> Premiership, um, finished third, did this and that. So look, played 250 I, games. Yeah, 252. 252. Yeah, well, those last two were really good ones too. Um, oh, look, yeah, again, it just depends. That you compare me to other players and I played more games, I, longevity, I achieved that tick. But, um, yeah, there's things there that I'm not um, happy with and I don't spend too much time, apart from when I'm getting asked questions about it, Fair about too that. much time reflecting on it. But um, I've had my go. I guess it's, that's one of the realities and, and, and you don't think it as a young person, but... You know, at the end of 97, sitting at the bar with, you know, Harves and Jason Cripps and we're talking and, you know, next year, next year, the year after, you think you're a chance and the reality is never got another chance ever again. So that, that was the one chance that we had and, you know, we blew it. So, and I played a role in that. So um, it's disappointing to look back on. Yeah, right. You, you, you think you, <laughs> I'm played, okay, though, so. you played a role in, in, the, in the loss? Or you oh, mean absolutely. You were in the team or? Yeah, yeah well, I was part of the team and we lost. So yeah. I've played a role in that. Um, and it's just an opportunity that you never get back. And then you look at other players who play three, four, five premierships or play in seven, eight grand finals. And even the Saints boys um, in recent times playing in a couple of grand finals. I mean, some of those boys, yeah, that's the only only chance and, and they've missed it. So Yeah, you think about how close they were. So they're hard to win Yeah, for some more than others. Yeah, well, it feels like if you were born on the other side of the highway, that would have been easy to win. Possibly. In 1989, you get to Moorabbin to, to play for the team you grew up barracking for. That must have been pretty wild. Oh, it was amazing. I, um, I've got photos at home of, of, of me in a Saints jumper with Trevor Barker's number on. I'm 9, 10 years of age. Which, in my mind, that's your number, number one. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, 
Um, and so then to go to the club, I remember um, I, I had to get picked up by some of the older players because I was 16 and uh, was for the, got invited to play with the, or train with the under-19s. So, um, yeah, I was really nervous and um, uh, they said I could train one night a week and I sort of said, well, how many nights do you train? They said, we train three. And I said, do you mind if I train three? Yeah, right. And I said to my club, Karingal, you know, I'll train three nights and there's no guarantee, but I'll just, I'll get the benefit, I'll be training and I'll come back and... So we did that and um, I trained the three nights and then just due to injuries, I got a, a game sort of one or two weeks later and then I played the remainder of that season in 89 and uh, yeah, it went back and played at Kringle for the finals series. So, But it was amazing to go to Moorabbin and, you know, been going there with my family for years, watch them on TV, you got the duffel coat with the names down the side and, yeah. you know, fully fledged Saint supporter and to be inside the club rooms and to see all these guys that you, you watch on TV or watch on a Saturday afternoon was pretty awesome. It feel like a dream? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it felt like an imposter. I, I can't even remember what, what it was about you that um, I've just always been... I'm scratching my head as well. <laughs> had the badge, you know, just... Um, it was you and Nicky Wimmer, my two, yeah, okay. two heroes. And I think it was probably part in your footy, which I, I loved. Uh, just, just, you know, the dash off half-back flank, kicking lovely drop punts. Um, Actually, I, I remember one time I, um, I was on the Saints website for some reason. They were doing an AMA with Nick Revolt. And uh, so I typed in a question. I said, what's it like playing with a great man, Frankie Peckett? <laughs> and he replied, he said, when I, I turn and lead to the ball, there's no one I'd prefer to see with the ball in their hands than Frankie. Right. He always puts it right on your chest. Oh, he's being nice and polite, wasn't he? Well, I, I agree with him. <laughs> If I was leading, there'd be no one I'd prefer to see with no, the ball. That's very nice. But yeah, I mean, so you, I think, the, so the footy's the one part of it. Great football, love watching you play. But yeah, you were always a bit cooler than your average footballer as well, I think. Like you drove the big old American car. Yeah. And you, uh, I think you had an eyebrow ring at some point. <laughs> I did. Is that cool? I'm not sure. I think it was then. In the time. I, I was ahead of my time. I don't know if it is now. That was but back I in the was 90s. Back then. Yeah. Um, I was a bit different. You know, um, even now when I catch up with some of the boys, and you know, I, I don't, I don't bet on the horses. I don't. There's things that sort of almost the stereotypical sort of footballer does, which I'm just, I don't. Um, I've got interests in. You know, I love surfing. I love music. I love cars. That sort of stuff. Um, it was interesting. In the 90s, at one stage. Some of the players, you know, a lot of the players would drive their Commodores and Fords, and then there was uh, there was myself, Tim Pekin, uh, Craig O'Brien. Um, we all had, you know, early '60 Chevys, um, and so I, I felt that there was some momentum being built around. Yeah, you know, let's push some of this other Bogan type stuff yeah. out the door, and let's push this in. And um, so there was a bit of that happening, which was good. And um, yeah, I guess I've always been a little bit different, um, which is which is okay. I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, well, look, I'm not um, not happy. No, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I'm not taking it as you were. I mean, if you, I didn't mean anything by it, but I was just saying, if you took offence to me saying you were pretty cool, then I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate. it. I was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, how did how did you end up in the film clip for Tism's Greg the Stop Sign? Well, my understanding is that some of them might have been St Kilda supporters. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that definitely one of them. Yeah, definitely one. So um, I heard through the marketing department that Tism were coming to Moorabbin to film a, um, a film clip for one of their songs. And they knew that I was into music, so they said, well, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, they struggled to get a few other volunteers because no one really knew who Tism were or cared. <laughs> Really? And it was during training, so Stan wasn't overly happy and impressed that some band were taking over the club rooms. And so I was allowed, or the, the, end up the four of us that were allowed to do it, we got a small window to, to get involved. Um, so I was thrilled I was over the moon because Tism, one of my favourite bands, I go and see them all the time at that point. And uh, yeah, the opportunity to jump in their film clip, which ended up being Greg the Stop Sign, which, which is a great song. And um, yeah, the rest of the one team. Of my proudest, one of my proudest moments, which says a little bit about my career maybe, but. Um, it was brilliant. I loved it. And I wanted to hang around and stay involved, but our 15 minutes were up and they said, right, get back to training. So right. there wasn't a lot of flexibility with that. 
And that ended up being, a, yeah, one of their great big hits as sort of a breakthrough. Yeah, I'd like to think the film clip had a bit to do with that. It really cut through. Yeah, it did. You know, sort of this show's all been put together around uh, heroes and meeting my heroes and that sort of stuff. Did you grow up with, do you remember who your heroes were growing up? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one because I, I know I had a, a poster of Elle McPherson on the wall. Yeah. Apart from that, I had a poster of a, semi, a semi-trailer Kenworth truck. Okay. A um, couple of great bodies. Yep. <laughs> a monkey riding a skateboard. Okay. And, uh, and a cartoon of Superman. Right. Outside of that, and then in, in my teens, I, I, I'd have heaps of surfing pictures on my, on my wall. Um, but you know, I loved the Saints as a kid growing up, and I, you know, the jumpers, I had um, uh, Super Duper, Bruce Duper Rizzle jump uh, number on my back first, I think, yeah. and had Barks. Um, but I never really had heroes or people that I was necessarily looking up to, apart from the monkey on a skateboard. Yeah, well, monkey on a skateboard. Yeah, it's Everyone a classic looked pose. Up to that guy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, when I look back, I, I didn't necessarily, I don't think, I don't remember having some specific heroes that I, that I looked at and followed and, um, well, you don't even know what it would feel like. I mean, you're your own hero. You don't need one. <laughs> if you are a hero, yeah. you don't have a hero. Yeah. I just look in the mirror. Yeah. Um, yeah, good point. Uh, no, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird because, um, I've been asked that question a few times and, uh, yeah, I just can't, apart from the ones I've mentioned, the monkey and the, the, monkey the, the truck the and yeah. Elle McPherson. Yeah. Um, not a lot comes to mind. Look, and I David bumped into Grant. David Grant. He, now, okay, so he was, he was one of my favourite players. I bumped into him a couple of nights ago. Um, he lives near me and I bumped into him and I actually had a beer with him a, about a month ago. Um, now, he was one of my favourite players. So I don't know, I, I wouldn't go as, he's not, hopefully he doesn't watch this, but I wouldn't go that far to say hero, but... Well, he's I, had, no, I had a bit of a man crush on him, I'll say that. No monkey on a yeah. skateboard. No, he's so. not. That's David Grant, I mean, he, yeah, I, I think a lot of people had crushes on him. Yeah. Um, I remember um, one of my aunties, she got out bit at, at, they used to do like, well, you would have been involved in these. Yeah. Were they like players' nights and they were like ladies' nights? Yeah, man oh man type. Yeah, and the, one of my aunties got out bid to uh, take David Grant's boxes off with her teeth. She was the second highest bidder. What a weird thing for me to hear as a child. Well, yeah. I, I, didn't, I don't think I'd process what, it, what that sort of did to me. It's probably, I'm actually now working up some, some background stuff. Um, but yeah, what, what was that about? It was raising funds for the very important football trip at the end yeah. of the year. So yeah. it's, it's always a good thing when professional sportsmen are raising money through the punters and the, the, the good folk, the, the members and the supporters to hand over some cold hard cash. Um, to support our footy trip. So they were nights that were organised by the players and um, yeah, they were interesting, a lot of fun. Um, a lot of aunties and mums and sisters and grandparents and grandmas and that sort of thing there. Um, and there was a few players that um, really uh, stepped up in those nights and, and didn't need a lot of convincing to oil up and <laughs> yeah, right. take their gear off. So um, David they were, Grant was one of those. He was one of those. He had, a, yeah, I mean, He's not in great shape now, but he certainly <laughs> he certainly had a great rig back then. Um, yeah, he'd be he would have been you know um, our team of the decade. They did that recently. Did you make the cut on that? Um, I, didn't, I haven't looked. I assume you did. The nineties, I did. Yeah, yeah. thank so, you for that. Yeah, back flank. Uh, possibly. Yeah. I started as a back pocket, you know, next to Spud Frawley, learnt McCraft there in the old days where you play on one, where you play on your player resting rover, um, do that. Then I graduated the halfback flank and then got a bit more confident and just extended the leg rope out a little bit where I didn't play as tight, which probably cost us a couple of games here and there. But um, uh, then sort of some wing exposure and a couple of goes through the midfield, push forward and and then back to the back line and then then to back to the, to the bench. So I started on the bench finish on the bench and that's that full circle. I don't think I remember you as a, a lockdown back pocket. Well, that was just the way you played. I mean, yeah, you, right. you played on your opponent and that's who you followed. So the ball would be there, but you're beside your opponent and... My memories are Frankie Peckett has found space streaming down the wing. I was good at finding space. <laughs> um, I just love to run. 
you know, that was one of my assets as a young kid. I could run. Uh, and then we went, when we went out to Waverley, plenty of space out there. And so I think they liked the fact that if I got the ball, I'd have, it, have a crack at going for a run and gaining some metres. So I used to love doing that. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. I just hoped that my teammates would have my man covered. Actually, went through a while there where we had a pretty good understanding as a back six. And that was I wasn't going to pick up my man and just let me do my thing Five and, six. And, and and then see what happens and if they start kicking goals then obviously I'd have to come back and yeah do what I should be doing in defending so you were kind of you were the the loose unit of the back six or the leader um not sh not sure about that there was uh, Matty Young so I went so Matty Young and I both Always look up to the redheads as yeah well, of course. he was a very good player Matty Young um but he had yeah you were you weren't too far different from each other yeah so so and... that's where it started to become a bit of an issue there's only room for one bloke with a long leg rope. Yeah. Um, sometimes when we we're both on the half back flanks, yeah, it was, there was some- It was all going one way or the other. Correct, yeah. so um, we had to address that. Um, so we were a bit similar in that regard. After, after finishing up, you, you kept playing, I remember people were saying that you were looking like, every year for a little while, it was like, this could be Frankie's last year. Yeah. But I reckon that went for five years, maybe. Yeah. Did it feel like that to you, or are you pretty confident you're always had no, no, more it was years like, in you? Yeah, one year deals for about the last four. So I didn't have a, I didn't, I, I didn't have a, um, a manager towards the end of my career for my last four or five years. So I negotiated my own contracts with Grant Thomas, who was coach at the time. That's you would you wouldn't have that happen anymore, would you? No, you probably wouldn't. But I liked it. He he liked it in the sense that. Um, we, we'd get together and sometimes I'd go to his house and we'd play some snooker and um, I'm not bad at snooker so I'd use that as leverage to try and get myself an extra contract and he'd pull out the whiteboard and he'd have 25 names on there and mine's not on there and he'd say well you're not in my best 25 and I'd go well hang on I'd back myself in before him him and him and just let me he was nagging you I reckon just put me on the list and I'll be there ready to go if you need me and so I, I felt that I had some well, I, I felt I had a role I could play knowing all these young blokes were coming in I, I accepted that um, I'd rather do that and play that role than having quit and sit at home and watching them on TV going, oh, I reckon I'd still be, I could still be playing or if they had injuries or... Because I knew that we were going to play finals. I knew that we were sort of improving to that point where finals are, and, a, and a flag could be and I I'd, I'd wanted to just squeeze everything out. So It was, it was super close. Yeah, yeah. 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 So was I was lucky to get those one-year deals and towards the end, just play the role and do your bit. And hopefully I'm there at the end. You, um, since retiring, you've, uh, you now, what are you, the CEO of leading teams? Chairman. Chairman. I don't we know all this mumbo jumbo. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's corporate speak, no, it <laughs> doesn't mean much. What is it like, it, you know, I, I obviously I understand what a leadership, uh, whatever it is, is. I mean. Sounds like Yeah, it. yeah. But for people uh, who don't uh, have the sort of knowledge I do, in a nutshell, you sort of go in and you make companies and clubs better at leadership. Yeah, so leadership's a component of it. It's it's what we help. What we do is we help organisations, teams, individuals to improve their performance. So whether they're already high performing or dysfunctional or somewhere in between, so we come in and and, and look at their culture first and foremost. So the culture of any team is behaviour that gets rewarded. So that behaviour can be productive. It can be counterproductive but we tolerate it, we accept it. People have got their jobs, get paid still, get a game of footy. That's our culture, regardless of what we might espouse. So we just come in and look at that, test it, challenge it, help them define what they want it to look like if they want to improve. And then we start to look at leadership and the role that that plays. And so once you've established your culture as a football club, as an example, or a, or a bank or a manufacturing business or you know, creative, doesn't really matter, automatically based on that you'll start to analyze well who are our current leaders how do they lead do they lead do they role model um, is it productive is it counterproductive and then you can start to analyze and, and build leadership capacity because we've actually got other people that based on our culture are really strong performers and so we we help them feels like a fair departure from you in the early 90s talking about you know partying playing footy living yep. a pretty fun life yeah what when did that click over it's just getting older you hit your 30 sort of thing and um yeah a bit of everything so teammates straighten you up and hold you accountable now that we've got a an environment that expects that and um yeah get i mean the light switches on a little bit later for some and so there's a bit of that bit of maturity 
um, bit of life experience. So I don't shy away from you know the way I behaved or performed. I just use that as part of my learning and what I share with others. That um, you know it's something I've lived and breathed for a long time. I've seen it work really well. I've seen it fail dismally, I've, both as a participant but also as a facilitator. You know, um, so I know the power it can have if, if enough people commit to it and, and want to drive it and, and build it in. And when I f first sat and watched Ray come into our club at Lawn and you know, I'm sitting there going, hey, fucking hell, like seriously, I'm having a good time here. I don't want to all of a sudden now be held accountable to my behaviour. Right. I'm getting a game, I get drink cards down in Frank's, we've got four pubs on the corner, I don't have to queue up. I can, you know, this is, this is you're 19, you're 20, this is good stuff. Um, but then I just started to see the benefit of it, that if we actually changed a bit of how we went about it, our culture, how we recruited, how we selected leaders, it would actually help me individually and help us as a team. So what, what I am happy with and proud of is that for, for a period of time there that you know, I, I was able to play a role in, in, in helping us be a lot more consistent as a club. And it was a, a whole of club approach. So you know, board, exec, admin, players, coaches, which is what you need to, to get on the one page and perform at a high level constantly. The supporters have been incredibly patient, but I think club administrators aren't overly patient. Not all, I mean, you obviously don't get online much. They're not all that patient. No, no. no. Some of like expectations get pretty wild from the same supporters from year to year. Yeah, yeah. Every next year there's people thinking it's premiership year. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Let's just yeah. Let's just be happy with a few more wins than last yeah. year, that sort of yeah. stuff. But I, I don't get online that much. It's no. not. Yeah. It's uh, never good. I don't no. think I'll ever feel happier after spending some time online with people's <laughs> thoughts. Yep. So you, you don't do much. I mean, you're on Instagram a little bit. Yeah, I, well, having said that, I don't do it much. I do, I mean, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter and, and Facebook. Um, okay, so yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't do much online, just Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> Facebook. Did I mention my Snapchat? LinkedIn, uh, Snapchat, um, TikTok. I engage in it differently. I don't get caught up in too much you know, um, uh, sensible or adult type uh, conversation. It's, I just, I use it, I use Twitter to read the news and see, just keep up to date with what's going on. Instagram, I'm a bit more, I, I like to send photos of the beer I'm drinking or uh, the, the, the ribs Melbourne, that I did last week. Melbourne bitter nearly every time. I'm a Melbourne bitter man, yeah, yep. Yeah, um, beer world's changed. No, no, I, I like other beer. But um, I'm just trying to get a sponsorship. It's not working. But right. Well, you've, yeah, you've definitely got a brand. Uh, there's some sort of synergy going on. I, yeah. see, I see a account in Melbourne, I think, of you. Yeah. Yeah, there's some brand loyalty there on my behalf. I, I normally enjoy your, your photos. are always very positive. It's always sunshine, beer out in the backyard. Yep. You've set up a pretty sweet spot out the back by the sounds of it. I was yeah. reading an article that was describing it with a half pipe and a... Yep. And you you got seven kids. Seven kids. Uh, do you know what's causing it? <laughs> I've worked that out. Yeah. And that's been. I'd be very surprised if I had another one. Oh yeah, you've. Um, yeah. If Teresa came home source, and said she's of... pregnant, I'd be very very surprised. Well, I've heard that. I've heard of that happening. So yeah. just make sure. No, I'm certain. Okay. Yeah, I'm certain. So. No, it's. I wouldn't recommend having seven kids. Anyone, if anyone's thinking about it. So. I don't think anyone is. Yeah. No. It's, yeah. <laughs> like it, you said, I if if. I heard, oh yeah, Frankie Peckett's had seven kids. If I didn't know who you were, I'd be like, oh yeah, was he from the 1920s? <laughs> I, um, I, I guess your kids being um, born so young, mate, some of them would have memories of you playing. Yeah, um, it's, <laughs> yeah a couple of them, uh, well, Tiama, I used to take her to the, to the games on a regular basis. She was a constant at, at Waverley and I used to have the child mining downstairs and I'd take her in and, uh, drop her off and then pick her up after the game if I remembered. So, um, uh, so she's got uh, a lot of uh, game watching experience. A couple of the others have been to a handful of games, and there's a couple of young ones that uh, haven't. I've, I've grabbed the old VHS tapes out every now and then in the man cave and try to sit them down and say, "You're going to watch Dad's highlights," and within seconds, if not um, even quicker than that, if it can be, they're, they're on their phones. They've lost interest. Not keen. Not keen. Couldn't care less. Well, it's just normal to them. Yeah, well, my dad's a yeah. legend. I, we yeah. all know my dad's a legend. Uh, a couple of them are still young enough to just believe when I say that I was a good player, that they, yep, sure, no worries. But a couple sort of have seen some evidence to the contrary. So, um, oh, they play it down. I play it down, so we don't get too caught up in it. Well, I'm pretty sure you won an under-17s Karingal Premiership, so. I did. 
So I did. You know, what are they? How do you argue against that? That's and an Antec cup. Yeah, I keep forgetting about that Antec cup. Yeah, you got a, do you get a medallion or anything? Uh, for possibly. Anset, huh? Anset, yeah. Anset cup. Anset cup. Yeah. Isn't that amazing. Okay. Yep. That you yeah. want a thing that doesn't like the company does not exist anymore. Yeah. That's and I right. haven't for quite a while. Yep. I have to. I think that makes it more special. Yeah. yeah. It does. Yeah. It does definitely. Yeah. Definitely yeah. does. You said you didn't really have any heroes growing up, obviously, apart from the monkey on the skateboard. Yep. What about teammates and people you played against? Did, who, who were the ones that stuck out as, you know, you admired the way they played? Or who were the, who do you think were the greatest players you played with and against? Oh. It's tough because, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you put together all the Saints teams you've played with, you could put together the Saints team of the century almost. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is a tough one, but there's the obvious ones. Plugger and Nicky Winmar and Harves and Lowy and Berkey. Um, they're, they're your go-tos. Um, the opposition players, are, I mean, I had my pants pulled down by, where do you start? Um, ben Cousins, uh, Mickey O'Loughlin, um, Andrew McLeod, you know, Buddha Hocking in the, in the early to mid-90s. You know, you're playing in the back pocket, you're always playing against the resting Rovers and obviously the midfielders were the best players. So, you know, trying to play against them was quite difficult as a, as a younger... Steep learning curve. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, they're all just beasts. And then at the end of the day, anyone can, can give you a hiding if, you, if you're not switched on. And Yeah, I end, end up having a few battles with, with the Indigenous guys, and I really like playing them. They're just amazing players. Um, but they could make you look very silly. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, I don't believe that. No one makes you look <laughs> silly, Frankie. I'm going to do that pretty well on my own. They say you shouldn't meet your heroes. That's mm. a saying that I've heard. Um, so far, I don't think that, that adds up. I imagine what I'll do is I'll think about this a lot afterwards and yep. have you know all sorts of regret. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I'll feel it. You know, full body cringes at a lot yep. of the thing, nearly everything I've said. Yep. Uh, during this, do you believe in that? Do you think that you shouldn't meet your heroes? Oh uh, well, I'd love to leave that meet that monkey on the skateboard. I mean, that would be. Yeah. That'd be brilliant. Um, I met a couple of my heroes at the Saints disco one night. Um, and maybe I shouldn't have. So um, I was in the um, line at uh, the airport to um, go through the scanner. And Queens of the Stone Age uh, were all just right. I could have reached out and touched them. And I love Queens of the Stone Age. Same. And I just stared at them. But I didn't go over. I didn't want to shake their hand. I didn't want to talk to them because I, it was probably more about I'd make a fuck out of myself yeah. um, as opposed to uh, them not being up to, up to standard. But... I've done that with a lot of music uh, people that I've seen over the years. I've done it once where I've actually gone and spoke to them and you and I backstage at uh, Rockalonga in Yarrawonga. Oh, I remember Rockalonga at Yarrawonga, one of the greatest festival names. Yeah, absolutely. A bit better than Groove and the Moo. Yeah. I told you and I that in, in my splurred, uh, slurred speech that I'd recorded a couple of songs and I had a band, we were called the Floppy Bats. Yeah. Um, and our album was called Playing Snooker with Rope. And uh, we'd recorded a couple of songs and they were really interested in it. <laughs> and I, I, to this day, and you've just, again, you've brought up the 97 grand final. You've just brought up me making a fool of myself in front of my heroes. <sighs> so, to, well, I'm, I'm glad you've taken I'm my time. I'm going to stop and have a can of Melbourne to, just to calm down. Yeah. Thanks so much for um, joining me here and uh, letting me talk at you for a while. You are my hero. Um, Hope it's not too far to say. Uh, you're maybe the greatest man who ever lived. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, that no, sits reasonably comfortably with me. Yeah. As it should. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. Thanks so much for tuning in. It was such an honour to have that chat. Uh, and if you want to see more of them, you can right here at Stupid Old Channel. Uh, they're available for your viewing pleasure. Why not also like and or subscribe? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that'll help you but and then if you, you hit that hit that bell it's another thing i've seen people say something like that anyway so um is this kind of all you wanted me to say yeah that's it can we do another take